And uh, the telltale thing is that you see this little red, this little circle with a pulsating red dot on it. You can barely see it up there. All right. If it's not recording, it's a square. And when it's recording, it's a circle and the pulsating red dot. So that's what I look up for when I remember. So welcome back again. And we're going to begin this uh, first lecture on the first course in the program of bioethics, the Master of Science in Bioethics at St. Thomas University. Our first course being the fundamental principles for uh, bioethics, for Catholic bioethics. And I always uh, begin with a little prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Blessed Trinity, we love you, we adore you, and we thank you for your many blessings in the midst of our difficulties in life, and especially right now, Lord, as you know, much better than we do, this epidemic of the coronavirus throughout the world. It's been going on for at least eight months, nine months, maybe more. Uh, we ask your blessings, Lord. We want to uh, thank you for the gift of life, for having woken up this morning and being here today as we begin uh, a new cohort of the program, the Master of Science in Bioethics here at St. Thomas University. I thank you, Lord, for the gift of the students that they may be able to engage throughout this program and be enriched as I am also enriched uh, by their questions or comments. We pray for all peoples of the world right now. Uh, we know that there are many who are struggling right now, uh, many who have lost their lives, many who are infected, and many who struggle with nothing that has to do with the virus, just with the issues of daily life. And so we recognize our blessings, the gift of uh, our health, family, friends, and uh, for our faith also, and our ability to learn and to seek the truth and a deeper penetration of the truth that you want to impart to us throughout our lives. May this program be of uh, profit and benefit to each one of us so that we may be able to share it with those people who surround us, especially as we get into the challenging issues of uh, human life and the environment. As always, we pray for those who are in most need of your divine mercy at this time. This we ask in the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right, so now we can get into my PowerPoint that I have here somewhere. Can I download it? No, not yet. Okay. Let me just uh, open it. No. No, I don't want to do that. Oh, <laughs> what did I do? Yeah, I'm in my Zoom. Okay, well, I want to go here. Okay. Thing for the PowerPoint. I think it's in here. There we go. Sneaky, hiding in plain sight.
All right? Is that uh, visible? It's a little, it's not ideal. Usually we, at the break, I'll switch the window opening, all right? But the middle window, I have to climb up there. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but uh, you can follow some of it along with the little outline that I gave you, uh, introductions, uh, just for competency, because uh, we're going to get into bioethics uh, deeply, and bioethics is what we call an emerging field. An emerging field is that is uh, new, fairly new, several decades uh, old, but basically it incorporates uh, two different uh, branches of uh, human uh, thought and learning, which uh, in principle have nothing to do with each other. For example, bioethics, biology, right? Uh, and then ethics, uh, biology, which is an empirical science by empirical. What do we mean by empirical? Anybody know empirical as we go along? There'll be a number of words. So part of it is vocabulary, is learning uh, keywords to be used because they are like tools, just like we use a tool uh, to, you know, a screwdriver or a pair of pliers. In bioethics, the tools are going to be words and images, all right? So an empirical science is something that can be measured. Is uh, Anything that can be measured is a subject of empirical sciences, meaning that uh, we use instruments to measure them and our instruments have become more and more sophisticated as we can get deeply within the cell, for example, at the level, at the microscopic level, and we can go into space and look at a very broad picture of uh, even the remnants of the origin of the universe to the point of putting a date to the origin of the universe. Right, so instruments have become more sophisticated and more expensive as we go along, but there's still a lot of unknown. But empirical sciences are sciences that measure things, and it includes now the social sciences also. So the traditional empirical sciences are biology, chemistry, physics, right? Uh, but now mm, social sciences are also included because they have gotten more quantitative. So social sciences like psychology and sociology and maybe anthropology a little bit, right? Cultural anthropology used to be qualitative and based a lot on opinion of the experts and so forth. But now uh, through standardized testing, for example, they can do profiles of IQs and other um, techniques and other concepts that can be tested empirically, all right? And what's in the background of that, of course, is going to be statistics, which will have one course in statistics here in this program in the summertime. Don't sweat it. Everybody sweats bullets, but uh, everybody does very well <laughs> at the end of the, of the course. Okay. But statistics allows us to do an approximation. We do an approximation by using an example because we cannot measure the whole population. For example, the human population, which is uh, anyone has an idea what how many are we on the planet? Are we in the millions or the hundreds of millions or the billions? We're in the billions, okay? We're already in the billions, which is 10 to the nine, nine zeros, all right? About 7.8, we're getting close to 8 billion people. I remember a few years ago, I think it was around um, 2000 more or less, or 2005, that uh, we were 7 billion. <laughs> You remember? Yeah. Seven billion was a big thing, right? Uh, and now we're getting close to eight billion because we're on the exponential side. We'll talk about exponential growth curve also and so forth, but uh, I'm just throwing out several concepts here. Uh, we cannot test the whole population of humans. For example, when we develop, when labs develop a vaccine for the coronavirus, so they have to use a sample. What is a representative sample? It may come down to just a few dozen or a few hundred people that will represent the whole human population. That's a 0.1%, 0.0001% of the whole population. So the whole issue of what sample is representative of the whole population of whatever species is a statistical question, okay? So 
statisticians, they play with the numbers to give us some degree of confidence or assurance that this sample represents the population. Anyway, um, why am I saying all that? Uh, yes, because uh, bioethics is an emerging field. It's a new field, right? And the empirical sciences are the sciences that measure things. And then we come to some conclusion regarding those measurements. So it's quantitative. And then ethics, which is the other part of the word, bioethics as a single word, we got ethics on the other side, which is one of the five branches of philosophy, right? together with logic, metaphysics, uh, aesthetics, which is the appreciation of beauty. And then, so ethics, uh, logic, metaphysics, ontology, which is the study of being, mm, ontology, and then aesthetics. So ethics is one of the branches of philosophy and it has to do with human behavior. And philosophy is certainly not a quantitative science, right? It's not an empirical science because how do you measure reason, how do you measure love, how do you measure metaphysics, which is beyond the physics precisely, you know, the possibility of the existence of God or angels or any of the supernatural realities, and even the possibility of the existence of the conscience. <laughs> we can get at it, but we can get at it through reasoning, which is one of the great two faculties that our Lord has given us. Reason, and the other one is uh, the will. So we'll talk about reason and will as we go along, but these are two great capacities that are unique to the human species. And in our development of reason and will, our engagement in the exercise of reason and will, we are truly and fully human. Otherwise, we live by instinct. And then if we live only by instinct, we're indistinguishable from all the other animals or plants that are in the planet, okay? So we have a biological side of us as mammals, as homo sapiens, but we also have uh, this uh, metaphysical reality of reason and will, which is unique to our species. And it engages us to live in a civilized way, to live as human beings on the planet, for example, using clothes, and you don't see any other animal using clothes. <laughs> so why do we use clothing, right? Even when it's hot. <laughs> so it's not just for keeping us warm. All right. So uh, bioethics is an emerging field, is thoroughly interdisciplinary. And uh, this is kind of signature for a number of fields that are coming up today, kind of thinking out of the box and putting together um, from different walks of life or different uh, disciplines of study that in principle have nothing to do with each other but in practice, they give us a better view of what, of reality, a deeper understanding of reality, like I say, a deeper penetration of the mystery of the truth, all right? And so this is bioethics, and because it is kind of complicated like this, it needs a competency in science, in empirical science, mostly biology, and, but it also needs a competency in philosophy slash theology, which is uh, what allows us to do the ethical analysis. Because after all, ethics is about human behavior, right or wrong behavior. And then we also have a lot to say about passing judgment, because even our Lord Jesus said in the gospels, do not judge and you will not be judged. And I don't wanna be judged, you know, after six, uh, decades of being in this world, I've messed it up royally quite a few times, and I don't want to be judged <laughs> for that. So I don't, if, if uh, my non-judgment depends on not judging others, I'm in deep trouble because I have to judge. In other words, uh, murder is murder regardless of the very good intentions of the killer. <laughs> okay, and we have to say murder is wrong, adultery is wrong, regardless of the very good intentions of those who are engaged in the adultery. How do we come to those objective judgments without passing, without passing judgment on the conscience of the individual, of the agent, but the actual action, the event, the behavior itself, that's what we're gonna judge, all right? So we'll get there. Anyway, all this preamble to let you know about competency. Again, because everybody has an opinion. 
we all have an opinion and we have to respect opinions, of course, but we don't have to agree with opinions because I can tell you that I think that it is midnight right now. It is midnight right now and I'm convinced and I'm telling you it is midnight. Look, it is midnight. They can say, well, professor, with all the respect, it may be midnight, but in, it is not midnight in Miami right now. It may mid, be midnight in, in China, okay? But not in Miami right now, not in Miami, Florida, okay? So I have an opinion, but my opinion happens to be wrong, you know, unless I qualify and say, no, no, I'm talking about China, <laughs> you see? So the words are very important. It's like, for example, I can say, and I can ask the question, we'll have to wait a semester to uh, answer that one in detail, but is the Catholic Church for or against uh, cloning? You know, how many of you say for <laughs> cloning? How many of you say against cloning? Not sure? <laughs> and I asked the class, the, the undergraduates, I say, we don't care if you <laughs> raise any, any hands, see? So uh, Chris, um, our four students here have said that the Catholic Church is uh, against uh, cloning, all right? Well, and I'm gonna say back to you that uh, the Catholic Church is not only, against, not only not against cloning, the Catholic Church is actually in favor of cloning, but we have to qualify it further. We have to put a few adjectives to that noun of cloning, <laughs> all right? And we'll have to wait a semester until we get into the spring course of uh, beginning of life issues. <laughs> and then we have to do some biology, also on uh, fertilization and all the process of uh, genetics and the DNA code and all that, <laughs> all right? But there is an empirical answer to that question. Mm -hmm. But we need to get there. Anyway, the thing about uh, competency then is important because everyone has an opinion but uh, not everyone's opinion is actually correct, all right? And so we respect opinions, but we have to speak with competency when we deal with uh, bioethical issues. Why? Because bioethical issues sooner or later involve life. It involves either human life or involves the life of nature, all right, the environment. And those are crucial elements that we have going on today. And even uh, pandemics are definitely a bioethical issue because I can tell you also in anticipation kind of whetting your appetite here that uh, there is some evidence that uh, the coronavirus, COVID-19, uh, the, the SARS-CoV-2, right, which is the official scientific name of the virus, may have been engineered, genetic engineering, five years ago, with an article published in Nature which is the most prestigious scientific journal of the world. Or a coronavirus was definitely engineered five years ago. Okay? So you have to wait three semesters to, to get the proof of that. But in the meantime, you can also do your own research because uh, the, the internet is um, amazing. How many of you have access to internet? I mean, okay, well now, uh, of course that's a rhetorical question, but I say, if you have access to internet, you no longer have an excuse for not knowing everything. <laughs> it's there, but everything includes the good, the bad, and the ugly, <laughs> and the beautiful. <laughs> so once you get into the internet, then you have to discern. Then you have to get reason and will engage to find the truth and to discern fake news <laughs> and true news. All right, but there's a lot on the internet, a lot of good, right? And there's a lot of bad in the internet all the way into what is known as the dark web where you can actually buy human beings at any age. You wanna buy a baby, it's there. You wanna buy a woman, it's there. It is sick, all right? So that's the dark web, uh, but thanks be to God, there's a light web, there's, <laughs> there's a good web, and it has a lot of good information, including these videos. <laughs> So it's all at getting at the truth, right? But we cannot disengage uh, the mind from that discernment process. So my particular competency, all right, is uh, this. Very briefly, I am a Catholic priest in the Archdiocese of Miami for over 35 years now. I was ordained in 1985, by the grace of God, three bishops ago. And uh, <clears throat> so 
uh, my background briefly is that uh, I was studying biology first at MDC when it was uh, just two campuses. It was uh, uh, Dade North and Dade South, which is now the Kendall campus. So I went to Dade South for a year and a half in 1970. That was last century, okay? That was last millennium, <laughs> uh, 50 years ago. I came to Miami when I was 17 to study marine biology. Any of you ever heard of Jacques Cousteau? Oh, tell me you've heard of Jacques Cousteau. Never heard of Jacques Cousteau, maybe vaguely. Jacques Cousteau, oh, Jacques Cousteau was my hero. He was the diver who invented scuba diving, the tank. He was a captain of the French Navy during the Second World War. And the problem is that he was, uh, one, one of the things was he's in charge of the Mediterranean mm, uh, scenario. Uh, I don't know how to spell it. Something like that. I think he's got, yeah, sure, sorry. Le Francais is some, it is a novel. Okay, Jacques Cousteau is an old man, but uh, you can read about him. Um, he uh, was a captain in the French Navy. And what happened was the Germans had already figured out uh, how to get in and out of um, the Mediterranean with their subs because uh, what happens is, so Germany has a port to the north, Hanover, which is in the North Atlantic, and they can launch there and then come around the, uh, the Atlantic uh, coast of Europe and go in and out of the Mediterranean, which is a very hot scenario during the, the Second World War. All right. And it turns out that the Mediterranean is only um, is uh, landlocked except for Gibraltar. I have to be careful uh, with myself because I deviate a lot from the lecture, <laughs> as you can tell. Uh, but it's uh, essentially landlocked except for two openings that are natural openings. Right? Kind of large enough. And one is the Gibraltar, the Straits of Gibraltar, which opens the Mediterranean to the Atlantic Ocean. Okay. And the other one is um, the, um, in Istanbul, uh, uh, what is this called? The Bosphorus the Straits of Bosphorus, the Bosphorus Strait, which again is a natural opening, which you can see opens to the Black Sea. Now, uh, what's interesting about uh, the, the uh, Bosphorus uh, Strait and the Black Sea is that up here is Russia, right? Which used to be the Soviet Union. You know, the, Russia has about uh, 12 time zones, okay? Yeah, so it goes halfway around all Siberia and that whole Northern part of uh, uh, Europe goes across from the North Atlantic all the way to the Pacific and across Siberia is the Bering Straits, right? And that natural jump that uh, got frozen over several hundred thousand years ago for migration of animals, including humans, uh, into America. But anyway, Russia, huge up here, but they don't have an opening to the Mediterranean because there's Europe underneath, except for the Bosphorus Straits because they have a port here that is called the port of Odessa into the Black Sea. And from the Black Sea, they can get out through the Bosphorus Straits into the Mediterranean, into Europe, okay? But this is a much narrower opening and is uh, highly uh, monitored and so forth. And they actually have to go right you know, in front of Istanbul. This is Turkey here. Uh, Istanbul is not the capital of Turkey, it's Ankara, which is more in the center, but Istanbul is that huge city, it used to be Constantinople and Byzantium, all right? So it's a millenarian city, it has maybe 2,000 years history, more, maybe 3,000. Anyway, that's the divide between Asia and, um, 
and uh, Europe, because on this side, on the southern side of the Bosphorus, is uh, Turkey, as you can see here, and on the northern side is uh, Greece, all right? And actually, there's another little country here, I forget which one it is, but that's, this is Europe. Is that uh, Romania? I forget. No, no, it's one of the Eastern European blocs, one of the Eastern European um, countries. Anyway, this is Europe here. And the back to Germany, Nazi Germany, the Third Reich had figured out how to get in and out of the Mediterranean with their U-boats, with the subs, because deep in the, the Mediterranean is um, an amazing sea. You see that it's totally surrounded by Europe on the northern part, a little bit of Asia here with Turkey, and then Northern Africa, including Egypt and the fertile, and the, uh, the Nile, um, how's the, the, the delta of the Nile, all right, huge, look at this. It can be seen from a satellite photo of the Earth. So the coast of the Mediterranean has been covered with civilization for about 3,000 years, okay? So by all accounts, and everyone has, all these civilizations have been dumping into the Mediterranean, all kinds of waste. So I, by all accounts, the Mediterranean should be really a Dead Sea full of contamination, <laughs> all right? And it's not, it's a very lively sea. And so it replenishes itself. And it was a big mystery how the Mediterranean got to replenish itself. It turns out that there are two currents here going through Gibraltar all the time, right? From the Mediterranean into the Atlantic back and forth. So there's a current coming out high, a little higher, but deep close to the ocean floor, there's a current coming in. So you get this two way highway of water happening in the Mediterranean. And the Nazis had figured that out. So they'd send the U-boats deep down to go into the Mediterranean undetected. Anyway, the Allied forces, what they did is they filled this area with uh, mines, with those ancient mines that were a big uh, circle. They looked like satellites with their things. They looked like the coronavirus <laughs> with uh, detonators coming out like this, okay? And, uh, but the, um, the Germans also put mines there. Anyway, uh, Jacques Cousteau and his crew was in charge in part of dismantling those mines. And the way to dismantle the mines, they had to physically go on top of the mine and uh, unscrew those detonators, which like, like big metal cylinders. They had to unscrew the detonators physically with the um, divers. What were those divers called? Um, scaf uh, scafandra. That's in Italian, let's see, there, got it. Okay, diving bells. This was called the bell, the diving bell, and here's a diving bell diver. Okay, mm, what they had is this bell was uh, typically copper or metal, some very strong metal that was attached to a suit, right? Which was a dry suit. And this would have a chain to the boat, literally a chain to the boat, and it also had a tube for air to the boat, so they could breathe down there, okay? And then the boots had lead or some heavy metal to weigh them down. And so you can imagine this diver is uh, with this uh, diving bell on, and he's got uh, unscrewed the detonators right, which are fixed from the, from the bottom of the ocean coming up with chains. You have this huge um, uh, old, uh, or let's say World War II uh, sea mines. Let's see if that does it. You have to put some kind of keywords. There it is. You just put, they're called naval mines. There you go, okay. So this is what the ocean bottom looked like, right? Uh, here's some, these are actual photographs. Here's one exploding, detonating. Uh, uh, here's a boat that would drop them off, <laughs> okay? 
And so what the diver had to do, he had to come up to these detonators and unscrew these things while he was affixed to, this, uh, to the boat on top, on the surface of the ocean, right? Hope for the best and say a lot of prayers because this with a chain down is fixed at a specific height, at a specific uh, height on the water column. You see them here, right? There's a U-boat going in between them and there's another boat on top, okay? But the, the diver, right, with his uh, uh, bill, he was not fixed at a particular depth he was bobbing up and down because the boat is on the surface bobbing up and down like this. So he's on a mine going up and down, up and down on the mine trying to unscrew these things. And most of the time he hit the mine and he blew up and he blew up the ship. And it was a horrible situation. And so Cousteau is thinking how to make the diver independent of the surface. That was the whole point of the scuba dive. Okay. And in fact, scuba is an acronym, right? Anybody know what scuba is? Well, of course, it's going to show me the Florida Keys and all that. Uh, but uh, scuba is self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. <laughs> the, and it's stuck, all right? So that's the acronym. The acronym, self-contained underwater uh, breathing apparatus. And so that's what he invented. And basically what it had was, is the tank, is the diving tank, which is just compressed air. It's not pure oxygen. Now they do some mixtures also, I guess, sophisticating for technical diving. But the basic idea of scuba was to make the diver independent of the surface, which he did. And the, the, the tank is just compressed air. And he got the idea from some compressed air tanks that he had on board in his, in his military ship. You know, maybe it was compressed, uh, I don't know, they were using it for welding or something. Those, you know, those, those cylinders of compressed gas, right? So he got the idea, well, why don't we slap one of these, just compressed air, the air that we're breathing. Slap it on the back of the diver, but then that compressed air on the water is gonna try to float because it's like a float, right? Because it's compressed. So then we just put weights on the diver and we find what is neutral buoyancy. So anything going up is called positive buoyance, like a cork, right? But anything sinking is negative buoyancy, like a rock or a piece of lead. But if we combine the cork with the lead, we can find on the, on, the, on the water column at a particular depth, we can find neutral buoyancy. And that's what the diver does. And the diver does that by, a sec, by, uh, by releasing some of the air with a vest that is the, called the BC, the buoyancy compensator, right? The buoyancy compensator is part of the equipment and she or he just releases some air from the BC to find neutral buoyancy at particular depths because the tank or the, the air will be compressed differently at different depths. You see, we have an average of one atmosphere of pressure for every 10 meters, I'm oh, sorry, every, uh, yeah, every 10 meters, which is 33 feet, all right? Mm. Anyway, uh, I love this. I, I would sit as a teenager on, on the floor of uh, uh, my living room and watch the adventures of Jack Cousteau, <laughs> okay, in our brand new black and white TV. <laughs> and then when it went Technicolor, I said, wow, that's what I want to do for the What I want to do for the rest of my life is scuba dive in the morning, sail in the afternoon, and party at night. That was trophy in my teenage years, in my early 20s, when I went to NBC and then FIU, when FIU started. I remember the bumper sticker in my uh, Ford Falcon, uh, uh, which cost me $100. I bought one of these transportations in 1970. The car was 10 years old. I bought it from a junkyard and it, it worked. Of course, it didn't have air. It, didn't, it just basically had a motor and <laughs> sometimes it had an accelerator. <laughs> and sometimes it had a brake. <laughs> okay, but it got me back and forth. And um, so that was trophy in my 70s, in, no, in, in 1970s, in my 20s, graduated and started teaching high school biology when I graduated from FIU. Uh, but the crucial mistake was that I started teaching high school at St. Brendan High School, which is right next to the seminary for the priesthood. 
And I kept thinking about the prison. I kept thinking about the people who were next door. The, we used to call them the penguins because the we penguins. had, yeah, <laughs> the penguins because they would dress. So the seminary, we can see the high school, we can see the students, the, the seminarians go to the chapel and uh, because it's a common chapel, right? The high school is over here, the seminary is across the little pond, the reflection pond. And we call them the penguins because they will have black pants, white shirts, and a black tie. And they will go single file, all in order like this, very orderly, from their uh, classes to the chapel. And then they would come to the cafeteria, which was a common cafeteria. But the students from the high school, which is mostly, you know, it's like 80% girls in St. Brennan High, <laughs> okay? And uh, these are teenagers. So the students were forbidden to mix with the, with the seminarians. So the seminarians will sit in one or two tables over there, isolated in the cafeteria. And the rest of the students were over here eating and they were forbidden to mix with each other just in case they would lose their vocation, right? Uh, but professors, we could sit with them. So every now and then I would sit with them because I was curious about them and they would tell me about the seminary life and all this. And I started thinking I wasn't married, I had been dating and so forth, but it wasn't working out. So eventually went into the priesthood or went into the seminary and I said to myself, well, for now on, biology is going to be a hobby for me because what does a priest do with biology? <laughs> what does a priest do with biology? And then the bioethical issues started coming up, like cloning and stem cell research and all this. So the long and short is that I have been sent for further studies, not once, but twice in my life, you know, which is way beyond my expectations and my capacities. And so what happened was the first time was in the 90s. I was sent to uh, Rome to get a doctorate in moral theology, all right? And I did that for four years in Rome. My dad happened to be Italian and uh, my mom was Cuban. Uh, so we still have some family in Italy, a little, uh, my, his, my aunt, his sister, who, who is now 97 years old, 98 years old, uh, little family there in Rome. Anyway, um, thank God I had learned Italian when I was a kid at home from dad because I didn't need to use it there, and uh, got my doctorate in moral theology, came back and taught at the seminary for a while, the one, the major seminary up in uh, West Palm Beach, and then I uh, was given a parish here in Miami, St. Kevin Parish, uh, then I started teaching, oh no, then by that time is the year 2000, and what happened in 2000 is that more issues came up, uh, um, with uh, euthanasia and physician assisted suicide and all the bioethical issues that kept getting more and more complicated, uh, in vitro fertilization, I mean, you name it. So at that point, my biology was about 30 years old. Okay, and I had to update that because I just had this little bachelor's in biology from FIU for, from 30 years ago. And you can imagine from the 70s to the 2000s, all the stuff that had happened Okay, so uh, I asked my bishop uh, if I could go away for studies again, and uh, he said, fine, what do you want to do? I said, well, I'd like to do a doctorate in genetics. He says, you're crazy, but go for it. <laughs> so I did it. At that point, I was 50 years old, okay? So I went to Purdue and got a doctorate in genetics and came back and uh, started teaching here. So I've been here for about 15 years, more or less and designed this program about five years ago, okay? This master's in bioethics because it combines the biology with the ethics and it combines my two backgrounds on the theological side and on the empirical side uh, because genetics is one of the hottest topics right now in, in uh, biology, right? And therefore launched this program about five years ago and you are the fifth cohort. I'm happy to say that I've had some students in every year to start a new program, okay, or a new cohort. So that's basically my background. Um, we also have this Institute for Bioethics, and one of the aspects of the Institute is the master's program. Another one is uh, to try to save the forest uh, ecosystem that we have. And you'll have an opportunity, two of you have already been in the forest sweating bullets. If the other two want to join us uh, next Saturday, we'll probably do that instead of lecture next Saturday, okay? Uh, <clears throat> So environmental issues. And also I've put together so far a couple of conferences, international conferences on um, climate, nature, and society. 
which are again very interdisciplinary. We have the recordings of all these uh, talks that were done. One was done four years ago, the other one was done uh, last year or three years ago when Laudato Si came out in 2015. Uh, by 2016, we put together the first international conference here on the environment. And one of our keynote speakers was Cardinal Turkson. I don't know if you ever heard of Peter Turkson. He's from Ghana in Africa. He's the one who wrote the encyclical for the Pope. Okay, Peter Turkson. And he was one of our keynote speakers for that conference. So it was just primo, <laughs> like the Germans say. <laughs> All right. Anyway, uh, I'll send you the links of all that uh, a little later on, but let me move beyond this first slide, otherwise we'll never get done with this lecture. <laughs> oh yes, our textbook. So this is our textbook for the course. We're not gonna see all the chapters uh, here in class, but we'll see some key chapters and you're welcome to read the rest if you like. Mm, basically, I'll talk a little bit about Ernst Meyer as we go forward, but the uh, fellow lived from uh, 1904, to 2005. So put that functionally into, he lived throughout the whole last, of, last century. He was born in 1904 and he died in 2000. He, lived, he was 101 years old. You know, he was a key player. He was an evolutionary biologist and population biologist throughout the 19th century, throughout the 20th century, 1900s. Okay, brilliant mind. Uh, empirically, but very weak theologically, unfortunately. So he ends up rejecting uh, uh, science, uh, he ends up rejecting theology and religion and faith and all that to his discredit. But on the evolution side, he's right on. Okay. And I'll point out to you what his mistake was essentially, which is circumstantial to his lifestyle, not to his uh, time, lifetime. And the religion that he was rejecting is the religion that we also reject, which is basically fundamentalism. We'll get there. Okay, so that's our textbook. Uh, this course and the entire program actually is a, what we call an anthropology, a theological anthropology, a Judeo-Christian anthropology. So let's look at a little bit of grammar we have nouns and we have adjectives, right? The adjectives qualify the noun. The noun is also the substantive. In other words, it is the whatness, hmm? uh, the substance, the essence. And this is a philosophical term, substance, right? There's substance and there are accidents. So uh, in Espanol, la sustancia, el nombre, and we have proper nouns and we have uh, common nouns. So each one of our names, Alfred, etc., these are proper nouns, okay? But the common nouns tell us the substance of the thing. So for example, we call this a phone, right? This is not really a phone. This is truly a microcomputer. One of the things that it does is it makes calls and receives calls back and forth. But it also takes photographs and uh, what else? Do it does almost everything except making coffee, for heaven's sake. So this is more than a phone. I remember what a phone is. It's a plastic box like this that has a handle on it and wires. That was a phone and it has a rotating disc in front of it. You know, now those things are in museums, okay? But that's a phone. Mm -hmm. This is a microcomputer. Anyway, we'll call it a phone, so we'll leave it at that. Uh, well, this is a book, right? The noun tells us the substance. It's very important because in bioethics, we need to get at the substance of the thing. What it is, what is happening, what is the event, you know, the whatness. The noun tells us that. And then we qualify the noun. We qualify it with adjectives. So an anthropology, it's a study of uh, humans. Anthropos is a reference to our species, anthropos, right? And logos is a study. So some added value for this course and this program is that you get a little Latin and Greek along the way. You'll pick up some Latin and Greek. So if you have some Hispanic background and you know Spanish or one of the Romance languages, French, Italian, etc., uh, you have an advantage because our Romance languages are derivatives of Latin, right? And Latin is also a derivative of Greek. So many of our works, especially the nouns and the adjectives come from Latin, right? And they're compound words that have uh, two pieces put together. Anthropos is a reference to the human and logos is, uh, logos is uh, truth, study, uh, 
right? So the logos, the word, right? And we say logos, uh, Jesus Christ, the logos for the Greeks. It means the word of truth. So truth or study. Mm -hmm. So anthropology is a study of the human, but this is going to be not a secular anthropology, not a horizontal anthropology of secular humanism. This is going to be a theological anthropology. So here's the qualifier, meaning also integrating and incorporating the view and the belief that we are God's image, that we're made in the image and likeness of God. So I'm picking up directly from Genesis, Genesis 1. Right? The last verses of Genesis of the first chapter of Genesis. So we're integrating a view of the human person that includes also a metaphysical, meta beyond the physical. All right? And how to do that? Because we have in a lot of people in society with very good intentions that they either on the scientific side, like Meyer, and end up rejecting and refusing sci uh, faith, God, religion as magic, or even to the point of saying that all those beliefs hindered the progress of science last century and from previous centuries, okay? Last two centuries. Meyer makes that actual statement. Sad, 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 because a brilliant man like that got caught up in a very narrow view of a pseudo view of true religion and faith and God. On the opposite side, you have religious people, very devout and religious, who say, well, evolution, that's Darwin, that's secular humanism, we don't believe in evolution, we believe in creation. What I will present to you for this course is that we don't have to reject either because both have the truth, and actually, instead of being either science, either creation or evolution, they complement each other, and they give us a fuller meaning of who we really are and the explanation for nature beyond organic, you know, even the explanation for the universe and the creation and evolution of the universe. So again, I say this humbly, but I think there's a lot of value here. There's a lot of treasure that is being missed by a lot of people simply because they have not thought enough about the issues and perhaps they have not had someone to guide them through the issues in a systematic way that we're gonna to try to do in this course, all right? So it's a little anticipation. We're gonna do a theological anthropology, but we have to anchor it in some kind of tradition. This is not gonna be a Hindu theological anthropology. It's not gonna be a Buddhist theological anthropology. You know, it's gonna be a, not even a Muslim theological anthropology necessarily, even though there are some concepts that interlock because uh, we are the three monotheistic religions of the world the belief in one God is uh, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, all right? Even though we accuse each other of not being monotheistic, <laughs> but uh, we are, in fact, existentially in the practice, all right? And so our tradition is Judeo-Christian, meaning that we're going to use all of the Bible, you know, Old Testament, New Testament, but we're also going to use tradition, the tradition with a capital T. So we're not just going to stay with sola scriptura, we're not going to stay with the Bible alone, because that's only one leg, we got two legs, and the other leg is the tradition of the church, capital T, meaning the magisterium or the teachings of the church, including the catechism and the encyclicals, and all the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for the past 2,000 years, because the Holy Spirit did not give up the job, you know, in 120 more or less AD, which is considered to be the last book of the Bible, the second letter of Peter, you know, it's not that he hung up his, uh, his hat, and then took a break for the rest of the uh, centuries. No, the Holy Spirit continues to inspire and inspires all peoples and inspires also the church through the official representatives and unofficial representatives, theologians, etc. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna try to integrate and incorporate all that. So what's happening? What's happening is that we have an onion in front of us and you know, the onion has all these layers and we need to keep peeling layers to get at the penetration of the truth there. And sometimes like with the onion, the more we peel, the more we cry, right? Because it's <laughs> when it's a good onion, it will make us cry. So we have to get into it. This, uh, on the one side, we say that human beings are created in the image of God, all right? Mm, and we're gonna look at that phylogenetically and ontogenetically. ontogenetically. What do we mean by that? So these are, again, key concepts. 
mm -hmm. and uh, compound words. Genetically, the reference of genetic is of origins, right? Origins. And then we have to deal with phylo and onto. So uh, onto is being, just like I told you, ontology, one of the branches of philosophy is to study being, right? When I, was, when I got into the seminary there at St. John Vianney, uh, fresh behind the ears, wet behind the ears, like they say, and I didn't know much at all about theology or philosophy because I was an empirical scientist over here. And the professor of ontology for a whole semester, he kept talking about being, Solis Silva, huge guy. You know, he kept talking, being, being. And I said, why is this guy fixed about beans? Are these black beans, llama beans, green beans? Why is he so fixated about beans? I didn't even have the spelling right. <laughs> he was talking about human being, divine beings, okay? <laughs> the person, quid est, what is it, all right? So the person, the being, and that is, basically a reference to our individuality. In other words, when do we begin ontogenetically is when does human life begin individually? When did we each begin, all right? Within our mother's womb and fertilization or when we got the neurons connected or at birth or maybe when we got our driver's license, when do we begin as a person? That question already is a real life existential question that has caused one and a half million abortions legally in the United States alone in one year, 60 billion since it was legalized in 1973. So you can see for one of those two parties, the unborn, you know, has been a lethal decision because society doesn't really know when your life begins. Imagine that. As a basic question is that, that's what this is fundamental. Okay, so very, very challenging. And I've had all kinds of students in here, including very liberal, uh, people <laughs> who uh, have their opinion. They're even, I've had do doctors in here, I've had nurses in here. So uh, this is uh, gonna get exciting, all right? So autogenetically is a reference to when do we begin individually, okay? And that's gonna be uh, next semester in one of the two courses for the next semester, which is the beginning of life uh, course. And we also have an end of life course next semester to see when we end organically and then what happens afterwards, if anything. <laughs> uh, phylogenetically is this course, which is the origin of the species. Because if we begin individually, you know, our parents also began individually and their parents also began individually and so forth. So we go back generation after generation. Have you done your genealogy, the map and 23 and me or whatever it is, <laughs> you go back I'm not into it. My brother has gotten into it on the Italian side, on the Spanish side, and he's got people over there in Italy and Spain and down to the Middle Ages and so forth. Fine. But we can go further back to thousands of years, to hundreds of thousands of years, and we can do a phylogenetic analysis. We can study the DNA and go back. And just to give you an anticipation of the end of this course, have you ever heard of um, mitochondrial Eve? Mitochondrial Eve, never heard of mitochondrial Eve, you know? Okay, mitochondria is one of the organelles inside the cell and scientists empirically now talk about mitochondrial Eve, which is when we do the phylogenetics of um, representative samples of the human population on the female side, we find that all females today, back many, many generations ago, come from one female, one female human. Interesting, that's why they call it mitochondrial Eve. You can look it up online. But of course, males, you know, it's an equal opportunity society, so we didn't want to get left behind. And so on the Y chromosome of the male, on the sperm, we can trace the Y chromosome because only we so far have a Y chromosome, we males. And so we talk about Y chromosome Adam. Turns out that all male humans can also be traced to one male. Now, whether they live simultaneously or not, that's a big question. <laughs> Hopefully they did. <laughs> and we all came from that one male and that one female. And mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam are not the biblical Adam and Eve that we talk about necessarily because we're talking about two sets of languages. One is empirical and the other one is analogical. Empirical would be mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam analogical language 
or metaphorical image language will be Adam and Eve of the story of creation, especially from uh, Genesis 2 forward. All right, so we'll get there also. I'm just giving you a taster for the whole uh, course here. Okay, so we're gonna look at the origin. Basically, this course is gonna be the origin of humans as a species, as a whole. When did we start organically, biologically? Because we cannot deny that we have a biological dimension to us, right? Okay, and when did this species start? Oh, God created us. Yeah, but he didn't take us out of the cloud and zoomed us in here like that. He didn't zap us into the, no, that's magic. And magic is a trick. Our faith is not magic. It may be mystery, but it's not magic because magic is a trick. And that's where people fail when they think that they can either be religious or be scientific. You know, they either believe in creation or they believe in evolution. I'm going to tell you, no, we can and we should actually believe in both. So I'm going to give you the evidence for both. All right. All right. So we also have a dignity that comes from being God's image, which is intrinsic. In other words, not contingent. I'm not going to dwell too much on this one. I'm going to pick this one up uh, last semester in the beginning of life and end of life issues because it'd be more relevant, if you will, existentially. We have real life human beings being uh, conceived and being born all the time, and we have real life human beings dying all the time. And that is done in either dignified or undignified way, okay? For many, many complex circumstances that surround uh, those events. But we want to maintain that there is a dignity to us that does not depend on the state or the recognition of society or whether our parents want us or not, or the doctor wants to put us away or not, okay? It's intrinsic and it's not contingent on anything or anyone else because it's contingent on God. The fact that God has created us because we're here breathing and alive today. So one couple of things that we don't really question is that we actually exist, right? And uh, perhaps that God exists also because this is not strictly a, a course in theology. We can get into the proofs of the existence of God, but um, I will give you indirect proofs, if you will, uh, just leaving it at the fact that God does exist, and then the consequences of that. We have to deal with those consequences. So basically what I'm going to give you is uh, the proof of our origins, ontogenetically and phylogenetically, uh, from science and faith, from both science and faith. And in science, it's going to come from evolution and genetics evolution uh, at the population level and genetics more at the individual level, which again, we'll see uh, uh, next semester for the genetics, uh, mostly, and evolution we'll see in this semester. Okay, so we're gonna delve into the process of evolution, organically speaking. On the side of faith, we're going to go into the Bible and tradition. In other words, revelation, what we call divine revelation, the word of God, in the Old and New Testament, the 72 books that we have there. Mm. And uh, we're going to look at the tradition with a capital T of writings and thoughts in the past 2000 years of uh, Christianity. Would All it right. also be uh, considered the revelation tradition? Yes, in fact, we can talk about that. It, it's only tradition. <laughs> because there is uh, oral tradition and there is written tradition, okay? And in fact, all of the books of the Bible, we know that before they were actually written down, someone sat down and write it, uh, there was an oral tradition going on, sometimes for decades, sometimes for centuries. And it was written sometimes not by the author, but a disciple of the author. From, so we talk about the Gospel of John or the School of John, whether he actually wrote it or not, maybe it was a disciple, maybe it was several disciples of John. And that's an argument for all the books, okay? So, and we'll get there too. All right, so now getting more into the biology itself, we're just gonna look at brief, very briefly at the last two centuries because we just don't have time. This is not really a biology course, okay? Um, <clears throat> but I try to bring, for those who don't have the scientific background, I try to bring you on board. And for those who don't have the theological or philosophical background, I try to bring you on board too. So at any stage, ask questions or make comments. And what I say is that uh, the only wrong question 
is the question that is not asked. All right, so don't, we're all learners here. I say that the best uh, student is a teacher and the best teacher is a student. So ask questions anytime. Let me see, I hope this is recording. Oh yeah, good, there it is. <laughs> a little paranoid about recording. All right, so for 19th century, for the 1800s, we're gonna see two key figures who are Gregor Mendel and Charles Dowry. Okay, because it happens that they were contemporaries, but they didn't know each other. Darwin did get a whiff of, uh, of Mendel, but he discarded it, and I'll tell you that anecdote when we get to it. Basically, these are two key figures as far as uh, we're concerned for our analysis of uh, genetics and evolution. Gregor Mendel, who is known as the father of genetics, and Charles Darwin, the father of evolution. Okay, so we're gonna look at them. And then in the 20th century, what happened in the early 20th century is finally we have the great biological synthesis of these two, because as I mentioned, they were contemporaries. The one was living in uh, England, as you know, uh, Darwin, and Mendel, who was a monk, Augustinian monk, who were the founders of this university, was living in Bruno, the town of Bruno, in what was then the Czech Republic, all right? It's one of, I think it's Slovenia right now or something like that. It's one of the Eastern European countries in the mainland, all right? So what was known as continental Europe. So again, contemporaries, but didn't uh, really interact with each other. And between the two of them, they had kind of the fullness of the empirical truth about the process of evolution, okay? So then comes what is known as the modern synthesis. And this is like in the 1920s and 30s. And that's why Meyer is uh, so key to us because he's a young scientist at that point growing up and he's picking up and he's engaged in this whole process of the modern synthesis, which was essentially combining evolution with genetics. In other words, Evolution tells us the how at the macroscopic level, at the level that we can see with our eyes. But genetics gives us the how of evolution at the microscopic level, at the molecular level. How is that possible? Okay. All right, so we'll look at the modern synthesis and what is known as population biology, which is the big thing today, and ecology, which is in situ. In other words, we don't just have individual organisms living here on Earth. We're all integrated uh, into our circumstances, okay, on a daily basis. And those circumstances is our ecology, our surroundings. Our home is part of our ecology. When we work, that's our ecology. For nature is the environment is the ecosystem. So every organism is embedded into its own ecology. Whether it's a pod of whales that migrates through the Atlantic seasonally from the mating grounds to the feeding grounds back and forth. It could be the, the mating grounds could be in the Sea of Cortez, which is that, you know, Baja California, uh, um, Right? Here is the Sea of Cortez is in here in Baja. And that has been spotted as a possible mating ground for whales. <laughs> but then the feeding grounds is going to be in uh, uh, Alaska and the Northern Atlantic, because that's where krill is. Okay. Okay, up here, so it's a migration seasonally. This, this is the mating grounds, it's nice and warm there and so forth. And then the feeding ground are up here because that's where krill occurs in abundance, uh, different times of the year. Okay, and krill is like a funny looking little shrimp. 
Mm -hmm. Right. And it's in the millions. So you can see here, for example, there's a, well, this is an actual shark. It's a whale shark, but it's a shark eating a uh, bunch of krill. <laughs> okay. But also uh, baleen whales and um, humpback whales. They eat krill also, etc. There's krill looking at us. <laughs> okay. So, why am I talking about the migrations? Oh yes, the ecology in situ, in place, all right? So it could be the, so for the case of the whales is the whole North Atlantic Ocean, maybe even the whole Atlantic or Pacific, Pacific Ocean, sorry, I'm not off the wrong ocean, Pacific Ocean, or for bacteria, for millions of bacteria, can be just uh, the inside of our fingernail. That's their ecology. They'll be there for their lifetime. Okay, until we wash our hands next. All right. So, Gregor Mendel and Charles Darwin, where are we? We are at 1115. Uh, okay, so let's do Mendel and Darwin uh, briefly, and then we'll take a break there. After that, okay. So here's Mendel, and what Mendel is doing is um, he was he is the son of a mathematician, and he's also a mathematician, okay. And he becomes an Augustinian monk uh, because he wants to uh, play with peas and do statistics on on peas, and he was a natural scientist also. All right, at a time when this science was just emerging, the 1800s. Again, little clarifications along the way, I'll clarify just to have everyone on board. You know, when we talk about centuries, the century number is always like one number ahead. For example, the 1900s is the 20th century. The 1800s is the 19th century, right? So 19th century is 1800s. So what century are we in now? We're in the 21st century, but we're in the 2000s, all right? So mm, you need some mental agility to be able to go back and forth. People get centuries and, and numbers confused. But when we talk about 19th century, we're talking about the 1800s. That's when these two fellows lived. So uh, Mendel becomes this Augustinian monk and in Bruno, the town of Bruno, There's this monastery, it's an ancient town, one of these medieval European towns, okay. Uh, so let's make it a little more informative. Bruno Mendel uh, Monastery. There's one trip I haven't made, which I like to do. Here it is. The Mendel Monastery and its little plots. <laughs> Where is it though? Where is it? The town of Bruno, Czech Republic. Czech Republic. Okay. And what he had was in the grounds, he started working with peas. Now, the peas is an older photo. And there's a statue of Mendel, I guess. Maybe not. Oh yeah, it is. No, Joseph, Gregor Mendel. Oh, first name Joseph. Anyway, he found with the peas that peas had what we call all or none characteristics, all or none, meaning that they either express one way or express another way. Okay, for example, the color, the pea, Okay, normally they're green peas, right? And when we see the pea pod and we open it, normally they're green peas. But every now and then, rarely, we get a yellow pea. And it's either yellow or green, but the vast majority are green peas. And that's why the green giant and all that, right? So the green peas, but every now and then there's a yellow pea. Then uh, also there are other characteristics that most of the peas are actually smooth, but some are corrugated. 
Some are rough. We call that rough or corrugated or wrinkled on the surface of the pea, all right? So it's either one or the other. It's not halfway, okay? Uh, and then uh, some other characteristics from the peas was the actual plant. The flower was either uh, white or violet. Mm -hmm. The flower was white or violet. So these are things that are very easy to see. The stalk also, the way the stalks are, they're either uh, staggered or uh, parallel to each other, the stalks of the, of the plant and so forth. The plants are either tall or short. So he found up to uh, seven or eight characteristics of the peas that were either all or none. And now these characteristics, today we call them phenotype. Phenotype is the expression of the characteristic, okay? But the background to it is the genetics, which is the genotype. In other words, that there are genes, specific genes that are regulating these expressions. So we can say that there is a yellow gene for the yellow pea, and there's a green gene for the green pea, and it's either one or the other, all right? It's a little more sophisticated than that with dominant and recessive and so forth. But basically, he was looking at the characteristic itself, which is visible to the eye macroscopically, macro with an A, not microscopically, all right? And today we call that the phenotype or the expression, just like the color of our eyes, the size of our body, the number of fingers that we have, and internally organs, tissues, everything. Those are the phenotypes, those are the expression of the genes. But the background to it, the inheritance, is the gene itself, and that's called the genotype, because it has to do with genes, it has to do with DNA, it has to do with genetics, and that's the genotype. That one we don't see. We don't see it macroscopically. We have to get into the cell microscopically. We have to get into the nucleus of the cell and look at the chromosomes and look at the DNA sequence. All right, so the genotype is hidden, but the phenotype is expressed. All right, and so Mendel, of course, he did not have a microscope and he did not know about the genetics itself, but he figured out from statistics and looking at ratios that there was some kind of inheritance factor that was being passed on from one generation to the other. Those inheritance factors, today we call them genes, all right? He had no clue of what they were, but he realized, and what he would do, he would do pollinations, and he would do cross-pollinations with, you know, a pencil brush, you know, a pencil brush, Right, so these are pencil brushes, right? Un pincel en español. He would take a little pencil brush and he would dab the pencil brush on the stamen. He would take pollen from one flower and pollinate artificially another flower, okay? First on the, the flower that he was taking the pollen, of course, he had to have the anthers, he had to have, uh, The flower, you know, is a reproductive structure of the plant, okay? And there is a stamen and the anthers, which are the pollen pods, the pollen sacs, this is simpler. The pollen sacs are here, the yellow stuff that's floating around in the springtime, okay? Some people are allergic. And that's the male, that's where the sperm is. Each pollen grain actually has two sperm nuclei inside. All right, so that's the male part of the plant, of the flower. And the female is a stalk in the middle, it's called the pistil, all right? And the ovaries are deep inside and the, the ovary has eggs, has ova inside. And so the pollen has to get from here to here to the stigma, which is the opening of the ovary on the top. And then one of those sperm nuclei actually burrows down through and makes a hole and makes a tube down into the ovary region, and then the other sperm travels down and actually fertilizes the egg. All right, so that's the fertilization process in plants. And so a flower, a complete flower, is both male and female structures in a single. But uh, if you want to cross-pollinate, right, 
you take one flower and you're gonna use the pollen from this flower and we're gonna pollinate this other flower over here. And so, uh, let me do it the other way around. Let's say, because this one is violet already, and let's assume that this uh, orange is white. Assume that this orange is white, okay? Which are the two flowers for the uh, pea plant. So I'm gonna pollinate this violet flower. I'm gonna use the pollen here and pollinate this white flower over here. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna take with a pencil brush, dab on these antlers and pick up some uh, pollen grains, which I can actually see the little yellow powder, all right? And then I'm gonna come over here, but before I get even close to here, what I'm gonna do is, uh, before I did this thing, I'm gonna come over here and clip off the anthers when they're still young and kind of green before they have opened up, I'm gonna clip them off. So I have sterilized, I have neutered the plant. This, this flower over here, I've neutered it by cutting off or spit it. I don't know which one is male and female, but I have taken off the male structures when they're still young before uh, they have matured, right? So that I am suppressing the self-fertilization of this flower of this plant with white uh, pollen. Once I've clipped this off, then I go over here, pick up this pollen with a pencil brush and put it here on the stigma. And so I am cross fertilizing this white flower with violet pollen. You follow me? And then I let this pea plant grow and see what the peas look like. If they're all white or they're all pink, the flowers, right? Because that's what I'm concentrating on. And so it's very laborious, it's labor intensive, but it, uh, I don't even know what, uh, what the cycle of the pea plant is. Actually, I should look it up, but it may be a few weeks, a few months, I don't know. But he would eventually have results if he was diligent enough. And he could start different plots at different times. So he would always have eventually some plots to look at as other plots were growing, you follow? So basically his monk life was analyzing the peas and he would open the peas and count the numbers of the eight characteristics and add up quantitatively. And he would come up with these, uh, give it to you, Jorge. He would come up with these charts, all right, which are called Punnett squares. So they're squares and you put the pollen uh, characteristics over here and then you put the uh, egg, the ova, ovary characteristics over here and then you do the Punnett squares and figure out the ratios. And in these spots, he would actually put numbers of P's, quantities, ratios. And then he would look at the ratio and one typical ratio was like three to one. For every one yellow P, he would get three green P's, all right? And that ratio was informative for him. It says there are inheritance factors that are coming either from the male or the female uh, characteristics that show up in the progeny, okay? And he called them dominant or recessive. So the one that was most abundant, the characteristic that was the most abundant, he called it the dominant characteristic. So for example, the green, sticking with the color of the P, the green was the dominant characteristic. But the recessive was there on a one to four ratio, the yellow, all right? Okay. Okay. So how did he know um, to do this process, the pollination? And how did he figure that out? Okay, pollination was already known because of what is known as agriculture and animal husbandry. So actually already for centuries, uh, it was known that pollination could occur, all right? They just couldn't see it microscopically, but they knew that if they mix pollen with the stamen of the plant, the stigma, that they would get a seed eventually out of it. It was done with agriculture for a long time. And also the converse of that with uh, animals is what is known as animal husbandry. You know, it was maintaining cattle, sheep and pigs and, and all that. So already for several centuries, this, um, this pollination thing was, was known, okay? It's just that it was not analyzed systematically, scientifically, like Mendel was doing, looking for the inheritance characteristic. Okay? All right. So Mendel comes up with these inheritance factors and he publishes that in an article uh, in an obscure mathematical journal, statistical journal, 
with his ratios, okay? Then we go to uh, Charles Darwin, who was contemporary of him, of uh, Mendel, and Darwin lived in the Victorian era of uh, in Great Britain in the uh, 1800s, 19th century, which was kind of a dual standard on the outside and on the surface in the public. Everybody was very correct. It was they were very prudish. They would dress up to here, the women all fully covered and so forth. But then in private, different things were going on. But there was a lot of uh, show, if you will, and a lot of pride, uh, a lot of uh, prestige, a lot of nobility and all this uh, counted. Darwin, as a young Darwin, uh, Charles, um, several of his professors were actually priests. But they were Anglican priests, of course, because it was Great Britain. Uh, and it was also prestigious for priests at the time, interesting to see some parallels, that um, for uh, clergy to be educated and to teach in universities in Great Britain, okay? And especially for the Anglican clergy, because to this day, uh, Anglicanism is the official religion of the British Empire, all right? And the head of the Anglican community, like they call themselves the head of the Anglican religion, is the queen. <laughs> hmm? She's the official uh, head. It's ceremonial today and so forth, but there is that alliance between church and state in Great Britain, something similar with the Orthodox, with the Russian Orthodox and uh, Russia, <laughs> and the Russian state. Hmm? Okay, uh, we had similar things in history with the Catholic Church, for example, the Byzantine Empire and the Byzantine uh, Eastern Catholics associated there and so forth. Anyway, uh, young Charles was growing up in Great Britain there in the 1800s. And uh, <clears throat> as a youth, uh, he was very inquisitive, right? And at one point, he, won, he considered being a priest an Anglican priest, actually. But then uh, an uncle of him wanted to dissuade him because this uncle wanted him to be a scientist. And so he got him, the uncle got him a post in this uh, ship, uh, the, His Royal Majesty's Beagle, <laughs> right? Because I guess the king at that time had a beagle dog and the, this uh, ship was called the Beagle. The, uh, uh, H-M-B, H-R-M-B, His Royal Majesty's Beagle was the name of the ship. Anyway, this was an exploration ship. Now, the big science at that time was, uh, anybody know what the big science was in the uh, 19th century, 1800s, um, especially for Europe? Keep in mind, this is kind of a continuation of the uh, exploration of the discovery of America, of India, of Asia, by Europe, and the colonization of those uh, continents, and then the trade with those continents, right? Back and forth with exotic species and so forth. Keep in mind also the search, the ever search of Europe for a route, an alternative route to the spices of Asia because those, uh, the Silk Roads had become very dangerous by land. Uh, there were all kinds of pirates uh, killing people and stealing the merchandise from Asia to Europe on, on the land side. So they were looking for shipping things and then they were shipping pirates also. Anyway, the thing is complicated, but the long and the short is that uh, because of trade, uh, mapping of the coasts of the continents was a big thing. And so the big science back then was geography. Geography, the mapping of the continents and the coastlines and where the ports were and where it was safe to land these ships that were all sail ships. Because the motor engine had not been invented yet. It was just beginning in the second half of the century with the Industrial Revolution. Well, you had the steam engine, right? At any rate, uh, the Beagle was a, essentially a geography uh, ship 
from uh, Great Britain that was going around the world mapping the coasts of the continent for trade, for British trade. Okay, remember the British Indies, there was a, the Indies, the Great Indies uh, trade or something like that. Was the West Indies companies, which was doing all the trade. All right, so uh, Char Charles' uncle got Charles a position in this boat, kind of like the natural, the naturalist, the natural scientist on the boat, on board. And so the Beagle was to be out for several months exploring, I don't know what coast, and that ended up being a five-year trip. <laughs> Okay, five-year trip that went around the world mapping the coast. And of course, whenever they got to an exotic place, uh, Charles would get out and look at the area and he was just, he was going from one fascination to another, all right? It was like looking at one exotic movie after another, like a science fiction movie, one after another every time they landed in Malaysia or they landed in uh, Singapore or they landed in uh, Japan or they landed in, in Brazil. Okay, and imagine the contrast. So for example, anecdotes, I put the mushrooms here because when, he got, when they got to Brazil, uh, what is now Brazil, which was back then, yeah, I guess it was Brazil already because uh, the treaty had already, the treaty of, of uh, Tordesillas had done, been done between Spain and Portugal. And so Portugal took Brazil uh, and that's why they speak Portuguese to this day. But he noticed that the Yamamami Indians there were poisoning their arrowheads with a mushroom that was being sold in the marketplaces of London. The same species, essentially. Okay, all oh, the concept of species was already around, but in a loose term, just basically naming things, naming, talk about name, by a scientific name, genus and species, which we'll get at, at in the second part of the lecture, okay? But the, the, the Linnaean classification of genus and species, Homo sapiens, was already around. Previous century from Carol, Carolus Linnaeus. Anyway, he noticed that these same mushrooms in London are edible. And in uh, Brazil, they're poisonous. So again, it depends, it's not just a mushroom, it's where the mushroom is and what nutrients the mushroom is absorbing. <laughs> okay, that made them either edible or poisonous, right? So I got him thinking, why, how come? What's happening here? It's the same species, all right? So that's one of them. Then when he got to the Galapagos, all the animals there that he saw that were very unique also, including iguanas, which are not shown here, that feed on, the, on seaweed that lives in the bottom of the ocean. So these iguanas, which are land animals, they're reptiles, their lungs, they have to breathe on air, right? They hold their breath and they go down and they, chew on algae at the bottom of the ocean, you know, shallow, not too deep, but they actually go down uh, and then have to come back up to land to breathe. And they expel salt through the noses, through the nostrils to get rid of the excess salt that they're picking up in the meantime. So it's very, a lot of adaptations. So he's thinking adaptation. What is this adaptation? Why are birds so different? Why is it just one species of bird, right? This, uh, a thing that can fly with feathers. <laughs> Why do we have so many species? Why diversity? The biodiversity. God, I'm thinking, he was a curious guy, all right? So that dissuaded him from becoming a priest, but his original influence was from several of his professors, even at the university level, that were priests, they were Anglican priests, and it was fashionable at the time for the clergy to get into science also. Of course, the big science was, uh, for example, geography or physics was also a big one chemistry and biology was just coming on to uh, being a science in itself. So he started thinking about the theory of uh, evolution, but he was living in this Victorian era where there was a radical separation, you know, between beliefs and uh, biology, especially evolution itself, because evolution would go against the belief of creation the belief of creation from the Bible. So the Bible was interpreted uh, in a more fundamentalistic way. And that's why I say fundamental. Fundamentalism was the downfall of Darwin and was the downfall of Meyer in the sense that interpreting the Bible literally, 
you know, God created Adam and Eve, put them in the garden, and those are our first parents, and we all come from them, and they essentially look like us. They didn't look more monkey-like, all right? They look like us. So the monkey is one thing, and the human is another thing, and never shall the two meet, no matter how far back you go, <laughs> with ancestors, okay? That was kind of unquestioned in society. So Darwin knew that he was going against uh, the beliefs of the time, you know, and even this clergy, this Anglican clergy who were scientists, they were not very natural scientists, you know, they were physical scientists in geography and physics and so forth. Uh, but if they were going to go into natural science, they would bracket their beliefs, that's one thing, separate, and now I'm doing empirical science. Mm -hmm. Darwin had a friend, a young fellow called Alfred Wallace, and Wallace was over in, um, I think he was in, uh, where was Wallace? In a second, because I thought originally he was like in Australia or New Zealand, but no, he was uh, in a different place. It's, uh, it is Polynesia, it is um, um, Malay, Malay Archipelago. Okay, so it's Southeast Asia here, which is very exotic also. A lot of strange animals and plants and fungi there. And I, Wallace was a naturalist and he was looking at this and he's also coming up with a theory of evolution of descent with modification, basically it's a key phrase, right? Descent with modification. Yeah, there, descent with modification. And so Wallace here in Malaysia, uh, um, comes up because of the rich biodiversity that is there, comes up essentially with the same theory as Darwin. And he writes a, part, a paper, he writes an article, a scientific article, a draft, and he sends the draft to Darwin for Darwin to review because he admired Darwin's thought and he knew that Darwin was also thinking in those lines. Darwin was reluctant to publish his theory of evolution by natural selection, right? His big book on origin. Mm -hmm. Should bring it, I'll bring you a copy after the break. Darwin was reluctant to publish his theory of evolution because he knew he was gonna hit against the established beliefs of creation and uh, the fact that God is our creator and how dare you compare us with the monkey or anything that is out there, all right? Mm, and so when he gets this draft from, from Wallace, he says, wow, I better publish because if not, Wallace is gonna publish and he's gonna get the fame. So that's what finally motivated Darwin to publish in the 1850s, his book of the theory of evolution by means of natural selection is a whole title, all right? the theory of evolution by means of natural selection, including the human. Mm -hmm. And he finally published it. Uh, there are more anecdotes about that and I can tell you, we'll get to it if we have time. But basically, uh, then he gets the uh, fame and the ill fame because then he's mocked and he's ridiculed and there are caricatures of Darwin looking like a monkey and so forth. Back in his time in the newspapers, he was mocked and so forth. Anyway, that's his theory. Okay, and so the idea is to combine these two, the genetics and the evolution. Uh, let me see. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the four fundamental forces of evolution which are going to be uh, mutation, migration, drift, and selection. All right, these are abbreviations of four key words for the four forces or events of evolution that drive evolution, mutation, migration, drift, and selection, which actually the first three set up for the possibility of evolution. 
but unless selection actually happens, no evolution happens. So selection, natural selection is the actual driver of evolution, okay? And we'll get to it and we have a parallel actually in human endeavor, which is called artificial selection, which for centuries humanity has been doing, maybe millennia, we go back to Mesopotamia, the fertile crescent of uh, what is today Iran, Iraq, that area, uh, Mesopotamia, where agriculture began, okay? So we have been doing not artificial selection for millennia, not really knowing the background, the genetic background or the evolutionary background, but we have been mimicking natural selection and we can do it in a few short years, what nature takes millennia or millions of years to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna break there for a moment because I'm sure we can all take a little break and then uh, continue afterwards. So it's 11.45, uh, let's be back uh, just before 12. I'm gonna start just before 12, okay? Because then we only have a half an hour to go. Uh, questions, comments, uh, Chris, let me go on uh, the thing here. See if you have any questions or comments. This one. Okay, got that. Still recording, good. <laughs> Thank you. So now I have to do something else. I have to go. Where is it? There's some message you've been sent. Okay. Okay. Second screen is an up. Screen mirror of PowerPoint one. Okay. Two point six mil. Okay, this was a question. Hmm. I wonder if I um Goodness, I think I messed it up for the screen. Okay, so now this is locked into this screen. But I have share screen. There you go. Oops, maybe I messed it up. And for the first half of the lecture, the screen was not actually up. Who knows? This is a big mystery to me. Anyway, I send you the PowerPoint also just in case, okay? Uh, in case the first uh, half of the lecture didn't have the full screen on, uh, you have the PowerPoint. Uh, what you might not have is all the other visuals that I did. I have a question like about these. this class. Yep. Mm -hmm. Are we gonna get to um, homosexuality or anything like yes. that? Yes, we'll cover it uh, mostly in the healthcare bioethics. Uh, we'll look at uh, transgender. We'll look at transgender ideology, we'll look at uh, uh, homosexuality, bisexual, we'll look at in vitro fertilization, we'll look at three parent embryo, I mean, we're gonna look at everything. <laughs> so all the topics will come up sooner or later. Let me see, okay, I'm gonna pause recording now. Uh, pause recording. Here we go. Okay, welcome back. And uh, I'm circling it around the uh, classroom here a copy of uh, Darwin's book, The Origin of Species by Beings of Natural Selection, and that's the whole title of the thing. Mm -hmm. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. Um, and there's a little anecdote to this, which is the following. When I was at Purdue, well, excuse me, taking a course, a graduate course in uh, sex and evolution. So a lot of uh, kids signed up for that course, <laughs> sex and evolution, because <laughs> it sounded interesting and exciting, right? Uh, and I'm the old man, I'm like the grandfather in the course because I'm 50 years old <laughs> and uh, taking this course, but it was part of the graduate program in genetics. And we all kept waiting for the professor to get to sex and evolution in humans. He kept doing plants and animals and all that. And finally, we're up to the last, last lecture, <laughs> right? It's up to mammals. And uh, so when I go, uh, professor, no, he wasn't a priest, uh, he was a scientist. He said, professor, uh, what about uh, the sex and evolution of humans? He says, well, that topic is so complicated and we as human beings are so, so unique that I'm not covering that in this oh, course. Okay. 
this is sex and evolution of any other species except the human. <laughs> he talked about some turtles, the frogs. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, in that course, early on, he asked the question, how many of you have read The Origin of Species? We were about 20 students in that course, between senior undergrads and, uh, and graduate students, uh, junior graduates uh, or freshman graduates, and nobody raised their hand, including myself. And it was so embarrassing that none of us, we're all biology majors, okay, and some of us are in graduate school, and none of us had read the origin of species. I thought I was going to be the lone hand down, you know, but no one else had read it. And it's such a seminal book, right? So I made a mental note to myself that I would commit finally in my 50s to read the origin of species uh, because uh, really every biologist should read it, okay? And one big thing you will find about that book, as thick as it is, he makes the argument and he makes the argument and he makes the argument he doesn't have a single reference. He doesn't cite a single paper, a single article, a single journal, you know, and it's one of the most valuable scientific books in the world, in human history. And he doesn't have a single reference. He says, look at this, review it, analyze it, think about it. There is a possibility that this can happen. And he gives all the arguments just by the power of the word of his argument. But he doesn't have a single reference there in that book. There's a glossary, but the glossary is just uh, the terms, you know, it's a noun where the noun is defined inside the book. <laughs> so very interesting. Uh, at any rate, uh, you try to write a scientific paper today, just an article, a four or five page article, you know, maybe one whole page is, is references, <laughs> let alone a book of several hundred pages. Anyway, uh, the argument stuck and it is the foundation, I can tell you, it's one of the two pillars of, of biology today, modern contemporary biology. One is evolution and the other one is genetics, precisely, those two pillars, okay? And with those two backgrounds and understanding, we can explain the bulk of what is happening in nature with all we live in organism that we know so far that's been discovered. Uh, so that's the anecdote to uh, Darwin. Now, his big thing is this, descent with modification, all right? So we look very similar to our parents, mm -hmm. but we're not identical to our parents. We're not twins. We actually have characteristics of both, of father and mother, okay? We have characteristics of both. So we have, maybe we have the eyes of our mother and the chin of our father and so on and so forth, like people say about us, right? But uh, so we have some characteristics of our parents, but we also have some unique characteristics that come up because of that mixture, because of the mixture of the egg and the sperm of the genetics that is involved. None of that was known back then. And there's another uh, anecdote I'll tell you about Darwin and then I got to stop talking about him and move forward, which uh, <clears throat> when Darwin was coming up with his theory of evolution and he was talking to some close friends and he was consulting with uh, Francis Galton. I don't know if you ever heard of Galton, but Francis Galton was another scientist and a multifaceted uh, scientist at his time. Turns out that Galton was a cousin to Darwin, a half cousin, I don't know which side, but uh, Galton had told his cousin Francis, hey, look at this paper. Because among other things, Dalton, uh, Dalton was also, Galton was also a um, mathematician, all right? And he was a psychologist, he was an anthropologist, a eugenicist, you know, think, thinking of a superior race and so forth, or how inferior races should not reproduce, right? Uh, <clears throat> uh, so he was a scientist in general, and he had seen uh, Mendel's paper. from the mathematical side and statistical side. Right. 
So like here's a sampler. And there have been many articles written about it. Uh, but you can see the original paper. There was another one in here that had uh, the actual paper underneath. Anyway, you can explore the website to see the actual original paper where he has all the mathematics, all the statistical computations. And Galton had seen that. So he showed it to, to Darwin, Mendel's paper on the genetics, you know, on these inheritance factors. He says, it may be interesting to you. The anecdote goes that Darwin rejected reading that paper because he couldn't understand the math. This Charles Darwin, he's got the book, he's got the, the theory of evolution on the qualitative side on how inheritance with modification and biodiversity and diversification and adaptation and all this. But if he had understood the math, which was just simple statistics, at the end of the day it was ratios, you know, three to one ratio, four to one, uh, he would have had the whole glory of the evolution theory and the genetics, the inheritance factors to back up his theory but he rejected it. So this is just a little plug for you guys to don't reject the math. <laughs> don't reject the statistics, okay? Because that is the proof of his theory. It's the genetics and we're gonna get into the genetics and you'll see how it makes sense at the genetic level, all right? Okay, so these four theory, these four factors or the four sources or forces or events Next lecture, we're going to get into them more deeply. And for the rest of the course, we're going to be looking basically at uh, mutation, migration, uh, genetic drift, and natural selection. Okay? So I'm just uh, stating them now as the four main forces and moving forward. So enter Meyer. Overall, for the 19th century, as far as we're concerned with regards to a theological anthropology of our phylogenetics, of our origin as a species, right? The two key figures are Darwin and Mendel. And you have some background there, you can explore more if you wish on your own. Because they do not really communicate and did not really interact scientifically or otherwise, these two theories uh, stayed on their own, floating around for several decades until the beginning of the 20th century when uh, this fellow Fisher, essentially, uh, Ronald Fisher, discovered and put the two together. Okay, so Ronald Fisher said, hey, Darwin's theory is substantiated by uh, Mendel's genetics. Because by this point, they already had some idea that DNA was a molecule of inheritance. It was actually a competition between DNA and proteins. All right, we're bringing you into last century. So about 180 to 100 years ago, it was not fully elicited then. It wasn't until Watson and Crick that gave us the model of DNA in the 1960s that DNA was finally corroborated as the molecule of inheritance. But the bigger um, candidate, the more likely candidate was protein, simply because proteins are polymers. It's like a train with wagons, all right? And each one of those wagons is informative, has chemical information in it. And so the most likely uh, candidate for the inheritance factor for the molecule of inheritance. At this point, they knew already that it had to be some molecule that was passed on in the eggs and in the sperm 
the most likely was protein, also because the bulk of the cell is made up of proteins. And there are thousands of different proteins that do all the pathways, all the biochemical pathways, what we call metabolism, body functioning. All right, so the most likely candidates for those molecules of inheritance were proteins, not DNA. The DNA was known that existed and so forth, but not really known its function, okay? And it wasn't until Watson and Crick actually gave us the model of DNA, the molecular uh, structure of it, that scientists realized this is the molecule of inheritance. And this is how the inheritance actually happens at the molecular level, at the atomic level. So there, again, there's no magic. Uh, there is, it, it's amazing how mechanical the whole process is, how physical mechanical. We had a, a scientist here who sadly we lost a few years ago. He, he went to NIH. <laughs> um, he was an astrophysicist from MIT and he was teaching here uh, a devout Catholic, daily communicant, and, and a great guy. I miss him so much because we used to have fantastic conversations. Uh, anyway, there was a transition, and NIH essentially offered him the post of uh, running the astrophysics um, program of NIH for the whole United States. NIH, National Science Foundation, is one of the, one of the two largest funding agencies of science in the world. Okay, non-human. The human side is NIH, National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Meriden. Their budget is about uh, 13 to 15 billion dollars a year. <laughs> okay, NIH, NSF, I don't know, NSF probably the hundreds of thousands of dollars, of billions. Uh, so, brilliant mind. And he was telling me, Father Alfred, I can't believe how mechanical the whole thing is. It is amazing, which means that it can be measured, it can be quantified either as matter or energy. And Einstein gave us that equivalence, right? The e equal mc square. And so either as matter of energy, it can be measured. So really there's no magic here. There is, uh, there is uh, physics and chemistry involved, but the inheritance comes to us very physically from our ancestors, you know, from our parents most directly. And so in the case of every other species that reproduces sexually, including plants, it's the two parents, all right? But for us, it's three. <laughs> in other words, we get the physical makeup of our genes, of our species from our parents. But the one thing that our parents could never give us is a soul, it's a conscience, all right? It's a spirit. And that's where for, for the human, it, two is not sufficient. It takes three, it takes God to give us that unique creation of the soul. Uh, and we'll again get into that uh, next semester. But basically that's the ontogenetics. At any rate, uh, Fisher had Darwin's uh, article, and uh, I'm sorry, Darwin's uh, book on the origins and had Mendel's paper, seminal paper on genetics. And he put them together and he came up with what is known as the modern synthesis, all right? Also together with uh, Haldane and Wright, will write these three were the big ones in uh, population biology. So the new field of population biology comes up. Population biology. Okay. And uh, who's a young scientist at the time learning and absorbing everything? And it's Meyer. So Meyer also becomes a population biologist and an evolutionary biologist and he picks up on, on all this. Right? So that is the modern synthesis. Now on Meyer himself, he's the one who gives us the biological definition of species. And I'm gonna dedicate the next few minutes uh, to the biological definition of species, the concept, biological concept of species. It has two characteristics, this definition, okay? It is an individual that has the capacity of interbreeding with the other individuals of the same group. That's the first part of it. An individual that has the capacity of interbreeding with other individuals of the same group. That group is going to be the species, all right? That's the first card I said, necessary but not sufficient to define a species. The second aspect of this definition is that the offspring resulting from that mating, from that interbreeding, that those offspring are fertile. In other words, that those offspring are also capable of interbreeding 
with other individuals of the same group. So the offspring, the progeny, the children have to be fertile for that to be considered a species and not a hybrid. Hybrid, for example, is the mule, which a male horse can mount a female donkey or vice versa, and they can actually produce an offspring. That offspring, you know what the name for that is? The mule, the mule, all right? Which has the strength of the horse and the stubbornness of the donkey. <laughs> so that's the mule, but the mule typically is infertile, sterile, it's a dead end because it's a hybrid. It's not an actual species. And even if some mules have managed to have an offspring, that offspring is infertile for sure. So maybe one generation gets by, but the second generation is definitely going to be sterile. If the second generation is not sterile, we're on to a new species. We're actually on to a new species. Okay? Because then progeny after progeny, guess what? Now we have a mule. We not only have a horse or a donkey, we have a mule. And if that mule actually becomes fertile at some point for generations to come, it's a new species. All right? Okay? All right. So the fertile offspring is key to the definition. And this is the biological. There are other definitions of species. For example, there are ecological definitions of species and so forth. They're centered less on the genetics of it and more on the environment where they live and so forth. But we're sticking basically to this definition of species. And, and Meyer is the one who made that contribution just last century. So this is bringing you up to a biology that is fairly recent. All right. So the scientific classification of species goes back a couple centuries back to 18th century, all right, 1700s, which the, with this uh, Swedish guy named Carolus Linnaeus, all right? Now, Carolus Linnaeus was just naming plants and animals according to their physical characteristics, and he essentially would give them a first name and a last name. And the first name was individual, and the last name was a common name. For example, a tiger looks very similar to a lion, and they both look fairly similar to a cheetah also. In their looking, in their behavior, they're carnivores, they're hunters, they have claws, they have, you know, they look similar. So he was calling the tiger, he was calling it Felix Tigris, and he was calling the lion Felix Leo. But the Felix, right, was a common name, like the last name. You know, I'm Alfred, and my brother is Claudio, but we're both Trophy. So the, the, la the genus name is like the last name, our last name. That's the genus. And the species name includes our first name and our last name. So the species name includes the genus also. But it gets down to the specific, Alfred or Claudio, if you have siblings, it's you or your sibling. You share a common last name, that's at the genus level, all right? But at the species level, we have that individual name. This is for species. And so he came up with this classification and it's stuck. It's stuck, and so we call it the Linnaean classification of species, all right? To this day, every species has a genus and species, all right? Like for us, Homo sapiens. It implies that in evolutionary time, there have been other homos that were not sapiens. Homo habilis, Homo neanderthalis, Homo faber. These are all fossils that we have records. We shared the same genus, Homo, but they were not the species sapiens. And some of them actually coexisted. Neanderthal and sapiens coexisted for several thousand years in Europe until essentially we wiped them out. <laughs> Competitive exclusion, we'll get there. All right, so this is the classification. And uh, I don't care how you look at it, forward or backward, but we start, let's say we start with the biggest picture, we have domains. These are all the living things on earth, okay? From domain, domain is made up of kingdoms. Kingdoms is made up of phyla, again, a little Latin, one phylum, several phyla. Then uh, phylums are made up of classes. Classes are made up of orders, orders are made up of families. Families are made up of genera, 
one genus, several genera, and genuses are made up of species. So we have seven layers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight with the domainia. Okay, eight layers of classification, and this is the tree, the classification tree, all right? So going forward from there, this is what we can come up with. This little diagram, you can study it a little closer. Here are the eight layers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all right? This is the name itself, the grouping, the grouping. So for example, at level of a domain, at the level of domain, we have three main domains. In this domain, is known as eukarya, all right? Eukaryotes or uh, organisms that have true nuclei. Then this domain is uh, subdivided into six kingdoms, six kingdoms, the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, the fungi kingdom, etc. Then these kingdoms are divided into about three dozen phyla, three dozen phyla, for example, for us, for humans, we belong into the phyla chordata, chordates, that we have a spinal cord, we have a spinal cord, right? Phyla can also be subdivided into classes, like I mentioned. So we're following the bear here, which is a mammal. And for the class bear, they are mammals, all right? Together with many other mammals. Then the class is subdivided into order, the order of carnivores. There are other mammals that are not carnivores. For example, there are herbivores, the ones that eat grass, like the uh, uh, zebra, or pinidae. Pinidae are the ones who have fins, mammals that have fins, like the uh, uh, dolphins and whales. They're mammals, but they have fins, etc. So we're in the order carnivore. Uh, but there are other carnivores that are not bears like for example, felines and uh, the canidae. Canidae are the canines, the uh, fox, the wolf, the dog. So we go into family. Uh, an order is made up of several families. So we go into the family of ursidae, which are the bears, right? Also urso. From family, we get into the genus, and it turns out that there are uh, several genera here of genus Ursus. And finally, we get into Ursus Americanus, otherwise known as the American black bear. <laughs> hmm? So Ursus Americanus, you notice that the species includes the genus name. But Ursus Americanus is different from the Ursus Polaris, <laughs> which is the polar bear, okay? All right, so this is a scheme, a schematic of how the classification works, the Linnean classification. And you can see here the three domains, eukarya, which is true nuclei. We'll get more into this as we go along, but eo means true, karya is nucleus in Greek. So true nuclei, we have true nucleus. Bacteria, which don't have a true nucleus, they have a DNA concentration inside, but they don't have a real nuclear membrane, true nucleus and something called archaea, which is very similar to bacteria, but they're more primitive than bacteria. And so they are archaic, and that's why they call archaea. Then you can see the kingdoms here, and these two archaea and bacteria are also classified into prokarya, or they don't have a true nucleus. They have a previous, something previous to a nucleus, pro previous to. You also run across the word monera sometimes. Okay. I know I'm over, give me a few minutes to just finish this. So this is the classification at the level of domain and kingdom. If we go further down into phyla, uh, class, order, family, etc., it gets more complicated because now we do it phylogenetically looking not at the characteristics at the, at the phenotype, we look at the genotype. So the phenotype, you know, there are similarities, but deep down, there may be more differences than similarities when we get to the level of the genotype. So what happens 
When we look at genotype, when you do a phylogenetic tree, the whole thing explodes into what is known as a family tree or a tree of life, okay? The tree of life that has the three main domains, as you can see here, the archaea, the bacteria, and the eukarya. But then we start getting into uh, kingdoms and class, order, phyla, etc. When you go more deeply in, it gets more and more complicated. Many of these, I can tell you, are actually microscopic. All right? Just to have an idea, look at the kingdom eukarya, eukaryotes, find where plants are. They're pretty high on the scale here at the level of kingdom, all right? The kingdom of the plants. But find animals in that scheme. They are eukaryotes because we have true nuclei in our cells. But animals, it's down here on the bottom left. You see it? Animalia. They're not really at the level of uh, kingdom. <laughs> okay? So on the level of class, and so it's already a sub-branch. We're at the same level with fungi, for example. <laughs> okay? But there's a larger branching of histoconths that includes other uh, creatures that have true nuclei and the branching. So this is a phylogenetic tree done not on the phenotype, not on the external characteristics, but on the internal characteristics of our DNA, of our genes. All right, very complicated, very sophisticated. Uh, notice the root here, because it's a tree that has three main branches, the three kingdoms, but a root, which would be the uh, common ancestor. The first common ancestor, a single organism. So we need to make the jump between non-life to life, organically and start with a single organism, probably something bacteria-like, okay? The proto-life on Earth, organically speaking. And from there, biologically, all species, the 2 million species that have been classified so far, and the 10 to 20 million species that are estimated to live on Earth <laughs> have derived over several million years, close to 4 billion years, right? Like 3.8. A billion and so forth. So this root appeals to a common origin of all species. So we share a common origin not only with the chimpanzee and the orangutan, we share a common origin with the fly <laughs> and with the pine trees. If we go further back in phylogenetics, further back into the branching. Mm -hmm. All right. So for now, we're going to stick with a simpler classification, which is this one which has uh, the three classical, the, the, the five classical kingdoms of the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, the fungi kingdom. They look like plants, but they don't photosynthesize, so they're not plants, the fungi, okay? Some are macroscopic, many are microscopic, like uh, mold and athlete's foot and uh, infections. <laughs> and then the other two kingdoms are microscopic, the monerans, which is bacteria and archaea, and this protease, which is really a grab bag. The grab bag of the protease, that's where we put the amoeba and the paramecium and the euglena and the algae, all right? Uh, this really is not a true kingdom, it's a pseudo kingdom. This is subdivided into many other kingdoms, but the common characteristics that they have is that they're mostly microscopic, except for some of the algae that we can actually see with our naked eye. All right, so that's the, the easier, the simpler classification that we're gonna stick with for now, for the purpose of this course is sufficient just for uh, getting into uh, evolution. Okay, I'm gonna stop here because I don't want to uh, go further in uh, over time, right? Let's see, we are at uh, 12.40 already. So we have about uh, three more slides, four more slides. Yeah, the levels of complexity in nature going from species up. I can explain these uh, uh, next time. From species to population, et cetera, all the way out to biosphere. 
what makes up a population, and then the factors, biotic and abiotic factor, and then the evidence, actually this one, this slide on the evidence of, evol of evolution, this is what we're gonna be covering in greater detail uh, for most of the rest of the course, all right? There's several lectures to come. All right. Again, any questions or comments? Let me see if there are any chats. All right, we've covered a lot, a little time. Don't worry, relax, breathe, and we'll continue on this path for the next few weeks. Oh, okay. So, uh, yes, I'm going to close the recording now, unless there are any other questions or comments. Or hello? Yeah, so summary, yes. Use the outline that I gave you, right? And oh, I'll, I'll email you that one. I'll email you that summary so you already have a word pre-formatted. Download it and just fill in uh, whatever notes you took today and you'll use the PowerPoint and this one, this, uh, I'll uh, make a video out of this thing and send you that link so you have the resources available. And I understand the first few summaries are maybe a little awkward for you. Don't worry, we'll, this is a work in progress, okay? So make that summary, send it to me by Wednesday midnight. I'll um, grade it and then have it back to you for next Saturday. Speaking of next Saturday, so anything else? I just um, want to finish. Book, nothing on the book yet. Now you can start reading chapter one, all right? But uh, we'll get more into the book uh, the next uh, few lectures. So there's time, there's time. You can start reading uh, chapter one if you wish, all right? Get your feet wet into that. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, let me close this for a moment and talk about next Saturday for a moment. Uh, Chris, hang on, don't uh, leave yet, but I want to finish the recording.